see the problem with these kids is if we go back you can see this area, the incisive foramen. So this is where the lip develops along. Once there is a cleft on both sides, this thing also tends to come in front. This is called the premaxilla. So here you can see along with the bilateral clefts here and here, the middle part of the lip is here and the premaxilla is also protruded. So here comes a challenge when during the lip repair, it's also important to repair the maxilla, premaxilla and bring it back to its normal position. Otherwise, later it becomes difficult to repair the palate and all. And that is the completion of the deformity correction. So now we come to the theoretical aspects of it. Now that we have seen pictures, we know the embryology. So what are the definitions? So now we know that there is something called an incomplete cleft lip, where the lip cleft has not extended up to the nasal floor. There is something called a complete cleft lip, where it has extended to the nasal floor and is extending into the palate area. There is an unilateral disease where the disease is restricted to one side and there is a bilateral disease where the disease occurs in both sides. And along with that, we have a very small subset of patients who have a microform cleft and that's a, just a small, you know, sound pitch and not much, but those also require corrections for cosmetic purposes. So examination of these patients, per se, examining a lip from the outside, it's just you can see the nose from the inside and you can define it's a cleft lip. But it is also mandatory to examine the palate along with it because many of these patients will have an associated cleft palate. Examining a child anyways is very difficult. You know, the child will not cooperate, open its mouth or anything. So in that case, you have to be very patient with the child. And you know, there are techniques where you can just put in a suckling device and the child opens the mouth and you can examine. Or in a calm child who allows examination, can examine using a gloved finger, you can examine because many a times a simple posterior cleft palate is also associated with a mucosal cleft that that's, we call there is a hard palate cleft, but the palate, the bone has also not uh, fused in the midline, but that mucosa is covering it. So that's a mucosal cleft. And then we plan. We will discuss the planning in detail because that is very important because that is where the treatment starts. See, previously, the thought was like that, you know, just achieving a surgical closure for cleft lips at around three to six months and a palatal closure before the child starts to speak at around, you know, eight to nine months, 10 months was all that we had thought. But now we, from the very first time that we examine a kid, maybe after just the child is born and we get a surgical referral, we tell the parents, we plan and we give them certain exercises. Like for example, you know, for lips, simply pressing the lips together, mom, the mother would do it and that would, you know, decrease the cleft size and bring the soft tissues closer together. There are certain things that uh, now for ortho orthopedic devices called nasoalveolar molds and all are available, which the child can use from very early life till the surgery that would enhance the growth and would fix the deformity of the nose that will help in the surgical correction later. These are all orthotics, they just help for the surgical closure so that the cleft doesn't go grow wide apart. For children with bilateral cleft lip, this is very important because their premaxilla tends to grow out in front. So once you give a nasoalveolar mold or a strapping, this premaxilla doesn't tend to come out that much. So that helps in the closure. Approach to such patients is we can define a lips, simple isolated lips as more cosmetic problem rather than palates which are more functional problems. For a cleft palate, what happens is due to the insufficiency of the development of the palate, the palate doesn't go back far enough to close the nasopharynx off the oropharynx. So these kids will have regurgitation if they try to swallow food. And the child will always have to be fed before the repair is done in a propped up position, in a 45 to 60 degree position with a spoon. They cannot suckle or they cannot do breastfeeding properly because they cannot achieve a closure of their palate the palate doesn't latch on to the nipple or the bottle. So they can be fed with a long nipple feeder, but uh, classically in our countries, they are spoon fed in a propped up position. And still these child regurgitate a lot. And we have to counsel the parents that lip surgeries and palate surgeries may require revision procedures for more so for palates, less so for lips, because even after lip repair, many a times these children will require, you know, rhinoplasty to for the nasal correction at around five, six years of age. But for palates, if the child has a velopalatal insufficiency, that is, the child fails to close the 
you know, the oropharynx and the nasopharynx, even after a palatal repair, that essentially happens at around 7-8 years of life when their adenoids and the tonsils shrink and the oropharynx increases in size, again a repaired palate fails to close the nasopharynx from the oropharynx. So they might require a, a revision palatoplasty later. And counseling is regarding the voice, the understanding of how a palate lip kid should be treated. So all these procedures must ideally be completed by one, one and a half years of age because beyond that, when a child starts to speak, starts to take on solids, treatment of these things become more difficult. So for lip, the timing of surgery is ideally three to six months. Three to six months. Previously, it was more for six months and beyond, but now with the development of pediatric anesthesia, with microscopes, loops that we use for magnification, we can dissect off lips at a very early age. We can see very, achieve very good results. Scarring is significantly lesser if we do in early life. The rationality of lip surgery is basically to achieve cosmesis. Cosmesis in terms of lip. What are the principles? First, we have to achieve the cupid's bow. In lip, in upper lip clefts, the cupid's bow is distorted. So the plan is to restore the cupid's bow to achieve the columnar height. The height of these two columnars should be symmetrical and to achieve a proper nose because nares in these children usually are very asymmetric and as we see, have seen in the disease side, the ally is flattened out, the columnar deviation is there. So the filtral columnar and the nasal columnar should look proper after this surgery. So what are the principles? The principle in these cases is to dissect out completely, to dissect out the skin of the lip on the outside, to dissect out the mucosa on the inside, to dissect out the orbicular sorus muscle separately and to, stick, to make them together. But the problem is there is significant deficiency of soft tissues on the medial side. If we go to this case, you will see there is good amount of tissue present here. But good amount of tissue is deficient here. And see this, if you look at this point and this point, this columnar height is high, but this is significantly low because here is the lip point and here is the point. So this columnar height is significantly less. So the principle is to make flaps or make rotation advancements like the Millard's repair by Richard Millard. So his point was to achieve a columnar deviation from this side and to put the, to rotate this flap and increase the medial length. And what Tennyson suggested is a completely different principle of repair where he would create triangular flaps, an upper triangular flap, an upper triangular flaps from these sides and he would put these flaps here to increase the columnar length. So those are the basic principles. The details of the surgery is beyond the discussion scope of because these are very, you know, high precision surgeries and mostly performed by pediatric surgeons or plastic surgeons who are who do lot of lip and palate surgeries. So the principle is to achieve a good columnar height, to achieve the cupid's bow properly and to give a good shape to the nose. Also, the functional part of the lip for pouting and for talking, for smiling is we have to dissect out the orbicularis oris properly and we have to oppose the orbicular sorus. Post-operative care is very important for lip because after lip surgery, for some days, you know, it's asked the child should not do a bottle feeding, bottle sucking because the lip would move a lot and, you know, there might be injury to the repaired muscles. So again, spoon feeding and usually lip can be done in a daycare procedure like it can, the child can go home the same day with the advancement of pediatric anesthesia with regards to that. And you know, and can come to follow up. Previously, regularly, as also by plastic surgeons, they use very fine monofilament non-absorbable sutures, like in the tune of a 6-0 or a 7-0 sutures to repair the skin on the outside. And routinely, the sutures ideally should be taken off by around 7 to 8 days post-operative to give minimum scar. But to take these stitches out, such fine stitches, child again has to go under anesthesia. So many people now prefer some monofilament rapidly absorbable sutures or polyfilament rapidly absorbable sutures like polygalactin rapide. There has been a lot of stigma associated with a clefts because these are upfront anomalies that the entire family, the community can see. And for these stigmas to be, you know, well understood, there are support groups like there is Operation Smile and Smile Trains and these support groups have come and they conduct massive multidisciplinary camps 
where children can come they, with the parents can bring their children and they offer the surgeries by expert people with very low costs or even free for some time so this is very important for a general surgeon at their practice to know that these facilities are available and you can find them on the internet you can find them anywhere and you can usually send these kids there to get the proper multidisciplinary state of the art care so this is a classical millard's rotation flap technique so these are the incision lines they are all marked like this is the filtral length on this side this is the filtral length on this side so how to incise and bring this rotator flap down and how to so this is a classical millard's rotation.